Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you again for the opportunity we have to meet together and to have this time together. And we're just so grateful that you do so much for us. And I just pray that you will bless each one of us here. Use this instrument. Use this voice and these words for your glory and, uh, and to, to, to learn. And I just pray that you will take over and put words in this mouth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way... <clears throat> You know, for those of you who weren't here Wednesday night, or for those of you who were here Wednesday night, you're going to hear repeat, okay? Is that okay? Because, you know, repetition, Lisa, is the mother of learning. You know, you keep repeating it over and over again. In fact, if I think if I would repeat the same sermon every week for six weeks, I think somebody would come to me afterwards and say, well, that, I have never heard that. That's really great. But I'm going to share with you something that was really exciting. In fact, Gene and Kathy were there when it came to my mind. And I said, the Lord has revealed this to us. And I want to share it with you. Okay? Can I do that today? Okay. All right. I just want to make sure you're with me. All right. Uh, by the way, and Cody, I didn't get your permission, but I've shared this before. But um, he's used to it, right? I'll be in trouble later, but... When Cody was really little, okay, and I didn't have him from, I, didn't ha I wasn't his dad from birth. I was, we were about four years old when I came into your life. And so he doesn't remember life before me, I don't think, very much. But anyway, the point is, is that I, can't, I got this little guy, he's four years old, and he has a lot of fear, okay? And... Uh, and I may have shared this before, but he was especially afraid, and he had older brothers and sisters that loved to go to the swimming pool and swim, okay? And uh, I tried to get Cody to, to go with me, you know, and, and ride, you know, hold onto my back, and I'd swim around the pool so he would get used to doing those things, but he would have none of that because he didn't know me very well, you know? I've only been his father for a few months, and... He didn't know me very well. So he played around the, uh, the you know, the, the, the stairs there. And, and all the other kids, all his brothers and sisters, were having fun jumping in the pool and swimming around and everything. And I felt really bad for him because, although he would tell me, he says, I was having a good time too, uh, that he wasn't involved. So I kept trying to urge him to, trying to teach him to, to swim so he could have fun with everybody. He kept to the stairway there and uh, one day after I kept after a few months I thought well man by now he should be able to do this and so I tricked him by the way he is now a swimming instructor he teaches swimming but he does not teach the same way that I do <laughs> he is much better teacher than I am but I ran up and grabbed him and threw him into the pool. Oh, how terrible is that? He came popping up, spitting his eyes are about this big, and I was jumped in right after him. Guys, I was in there with him, and I pulled him up, and, and he was coughing and sputtering, and he began to cry and show his... Uh, uh, he was upset with me, of course. And, uh, but that was the beginning of his career. <laughs> he became a lifeguard, and now he teaches lessons and, and all that. And he says, Dad, don't take any credit for that. <laughs> despite you, despite you, this is what I'm doing. He says, you taught me how not to do it, so now i got to go and make things right with the world. So, but you know what? How many of us have fears? Come on, get them up there. Do you afraid because people see you? Yeah. Well, I know every one of you have fears. Because I do. You know? And we live, by the way, in a scary world. Right? Right? It's kind of like um, Bilbo Baggins who said, as he, he says, you never know. It's a dangerous world when you go out your front door. It is. 
We sometimes do that. In fact, do you know there are people who are so afraid they never leave their house? Never. Because they're too afraid. I don't think eyes are ever afraid, Rachel. No. Yeah. Eyes never afraid. Like my son said, they're not smart enough to, because they... <laughs> but I... <laughs> My son was afraid of, every, uh, you know, my older boy was afraid of everything, too. My daughter was never scared of anything. And my son, I said, why aren't you brave like your, aren't you not, you know, like your sister? And she, he says, well, that's because she's not smart enough to know the dangers. <laughs> I said, okay. But, you know, um, God is asking us to live in a scary world, isn't he? But he asks us not to be afraid, right? Do you know we live in the last days? How many have read the book of Revelation? Huh? Is it, can, it, it's a little intimidating and scary, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, we are in the last days. How many believe that Jesus is coming soon? Do you believe Jesus is coming did you know Jesus is coming soon? But did you know before Jesus comes, there's going to be a time of trouble that is beyond anything we can even imagine? I'm trying to scare you now, okay? Am I doing a good job? Read, the, read it. It'll scare you. It puts hair. Your hair comes up on the back of your neck. You know? A time of trouble. It's coming. That's really scary. You know, I have a hard time being, not being afraid and worrying all the time. I know that's that's because what that's kind of what S's do. They like to worry a bit. I don't know how many times that I have made decisions because I was afraid of what might happen. Or I was afraid of making decisions because it might be the wrong decision. And I missed out on a lot of things that I would have liked to have done, but I I was too afraid. The Bible says He wants us, God wants us to live by faith in our life not fear. What is God's first message? When he sends a messenger to this world, what is the first message that any of those messengers give to the world? Don't be afraid. Fear not. Every single time God sends a message, don't be, the, don't be afraid. Luke 18.8 Jesus said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? My friends, are you living your life every day by faith, or you're living your life in fear? I'm really excited because Kathy challenged me on this, and, and what we're learning is really brought a lot of peace, right? And And... If we believe that Jesus is coming soon and the world is going to fall apart and scary things will happen, so how do we live without fear? Right? Jesus told us in Matthew 24 how we might know his coming is near by all the signs and wonders. Those are kind of scary. Some of those are very scary, scary signs, right? In other words, I tell people, boy, I don't know how it can get worse. I say, well, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Well, that's really comforting. So in Matthew 25, though, the reason that Jesus tells us the signs, he says, at the end of Matthew 24, he says, but you don't know when I'm going to come. You don't know when I'm going to come, so be ready, be watchful, be prepared. And so I keep thinking, well, how do you prepare? Well, I know that as I was growing up in this church, the way I thought, I was misconstrued, that the way I thought we would prepare for Jesus' second coming and be prepared for all these terrible things that are going to happen was to start putting together charts of when they were going to happen and how they were going to happen. And I would go through there, and the more I dwelt on those scary things, the more I got scared. And then I thought, if I don't have the charts right, I'm going to be lost because I won't be prepared. How many of you have felt that way growing up in the church? Did you feel that way? Boy, you guys are lucky. 
But I was afraid. I was afraid because I didn't think I would be able to um, meet the God's expectations. How many of you ever felt that you just aren't going to make up? God has these expectations for you and has a checklist for you to do, and you feel like, I don't know if I can do it. Come on. Any of you feel that way? If you don't, I'm, you're blessed. But I'm going to tell you something. God, Jesus in Matthew 25, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25, gave us the answer, Gene, this week. Because Matthew 25, Jesus tells us to be watch and to be ready and to be prepared. And then he gives us three stories on how or what God's people are going to be doing just before he comes. And how we will be prepared. Okay? The first story is the story of what? Can anybody tell me, Matthew 25, what the first story he tells is about? Ten virgins. Ten virgins. Okay? Now, virgins in the Bible represent what? Anybody tell me? Huh? God's people, right? The believers. Those ten virgins are believers. Okay? So we're talking about the... What? Are we talking about the, uh, the wicked in the world? No, the story is about God's people waiting for Jesus to come, right? So it's God's people. We're not talking about the wicked and, and those that aren't a part of that. And those, remember, those ten virgins, were some, five were foolish and five were wise. So what were the virgins doing while they were waiting for Jesus to come? Huh? They were sleeping. Were, were the foolish ones sleeping? Were the wise ones sleeping? They were all sleeping. So that's not the difference between the two, right? The difference between the two wasn't because they were sleeping. They, they, were, they were tired. It was late. And the bridegroom hasn't come yet. I had probably been sleeping too. But they're sleeping. So the difference between the foolish and the wise was not about whether they slept or not. The difference is at the end, if you will open your Bibles to verse 12, remember, the wise, the foolish ones came to the wise and said, give us some of your oil, right? And they said, well, we're not going to have enough. Go and buy some. So while they were going to buy some, the wise went in to the, to the groom. The groom came and they all went in. And then when the wise showed up, there is some tragic words that were spoken. They knocked on the door. We're here. We've got, did they have the oil? They had the oil. The only difference between the two is these words. Verse 12, but he answered, truly I say to you, the most tragic words, I do not know you. How tragic. I don't know you. That was the difference. And so Jesus is trying to say, preparing for my coming, you can't just wait to the last minute. In other words, all these charts that you're doing, you're saying, okay, looks like Jesus' coming isn't going to be for, it can't happen now because we got a few more years to go because things have to develop. So I'll just wait and get to know Jesus then. Is that the right way to do it? No. Every day, my friends, listen to this. Jesus said, what are God's people going to be doing while they're waiting for Jesus to come? They're going to be spending time getting to know Jesus every single day. Every day. He is going to be a part of their life every day. Pastor, that's just too, too simple. You're right. It is simple. But it's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? Because we're all so busy. But take time to be with Jesus, to get to know him. The foolish thought they could wait till the last minute to get to know Jesus. We can't get to know somebody through somebody else. They went and said to the wise, give us your oil. You can't get a relationship from somebody else. I tell my kids, there's one thing. I'll give you everything that I can give you, but there's one thing I can never give you, and that's a relationship with Jesus. I can't give that to you. That's yours as if you were the only person on earth. So you can't go on the coattails of your parents, young people. 
That's something you have to find for yourself. And, by the way, Jesus, we get to know someone. You can get to, you know, someone, your parents and your teachers will tell you about Jesus. And so you may know a lot about him, but that doesn't mean you know him. Right? You have to get to know him for yourself. Spend time each day. Seek him with all your heart. Okay, but forget that story right now, okay? Now, here's the thing. I wanted to get into the next story because the next story is what was really exciting to me because it's something I learned today and I, uh, this week and I wanted to share with you. And listen to this. Um, but I, in, in fact, you know what? We're going to skip the video because I'm running out of time. Is that all right? But I'll tell you the story, okay? The story is... As, who knows the second story? Anybody tell me what the second story is? The parable of the talents. What's a talent anyway, by the way? I, I don't have many talents, but some of you have lots of talents. But what's a talent supposed to be? Huh? Money. Could be money. What else? Gifts. Where do those gifts and money come from? Abby, what? They what? Do tricks and stuff? Yeah, they have some good talents, right? America's got talent, right? Riverside has talent. Okay? Those are the kinds of things we have. We have those talents. And uh, we got, where do those come from? God gives it to them, all right? He gives those talents and those gifts to us and how we use them. So here's the story is, is that there was a master who owned everything, and he had servants. He had three servants there, and he gave to one servant. He gave ten. He was going on a long trip. He's going, for, uh, going back to New York to do business for many, many months, okay? So he goes, and he gives his one servant uh, ten, I mean, five talents. He gives the other one two, and he gives to the last one one, right? As, and, and, and the Bible says in the story, as, they, as, as their abilities... In other words, he didn't give them or expect more from them than they could do, right? That's kind of nice to know, isn't it? Because remember I was telling you that growing up I felt like the God, I wasn't meeting God's expectations? Well, God has only given what he knows that I can handle and what I can do, right? Okay, so here's the thing. The story is that in this story... He gives them, and he expects, has expectations, doesn't he? And he gives them those talents. When he comes back, after a long trip, he comes back. What does the, the first one do that has five talents? What does he do? He goes out and invests it and earns what? Five more. You know, I always think of this as just about money. That's all I thought. Oh, this is just a good stewardship sermon. But listen, follow me here. So he goes out, and he, he gets five more. The one that has two goes out and invests it and gets two more, right? Okay. How many have done investing? Okay. How many think investing is gambling? It's a light gambling, you know, right? Okay. In, and now, don't go from here, and pastor says, we can go out and gamble. I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. Because there's high risk and there's low risk, right? Gambling is very high risk. I don't know of any casino in the world that loses money. They have a bunch of money, right? So they never lose. The house never loses. Just remember that. In the end, they always make money. The, the issue is, is that though making investments is risky, right? It's risky. By the way, going out your front door every day is a risk, isn't it? Right? Getting behind the wheel is risky. You never know. There's a lot of crazy drivers out there. I always make sure in my rear view mirror it's not one of you guys out there. 
But the point is, is that life is risky, right? Any business adventure or any investment, there is an element of risk. Even living life is risky. There are many who don't even venture out their front doors because it's too much of a risk because they're too fearful of the risk. It's, it's too risky. But seriously, well, obviously none of you are that way because you ended up here in church today. The risk is whether I'll keep you till 1230 or not, right? But you took a risk to come here, right? Get in your car, come here, there's a risk. And you have to weigh out those risks. And seriously, many of us allow fear, the fear of the risk, keep us from doing what we would like to do, even following Jesus and what he would like you to do. The beauty of living by faith, the Bible says, in Jesus is that he promised us it will all work out. He never gives expectations on you that he doesn't give you the ability and the help to succeed. Never. When he gave the five talents to that one man according to his ability and the two talents to the one man according to his ability and the one according to his ability, he did that with certain expectations, but he never put more expectations on them than he didn't provide help to make it happen. He knew the servant would come back like that. And he said to them, so the first two servants doubled their investment, and the master said what? Well done, thou good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your Lord. By the way, what brings Jesus joy? Huh? What do you think brings joy to Jesus' heart? I know it's not my singing, uh, Huh? Obedience and praise, okay? That's part of it. But what is the ultimate joy in Jesus' life? Trusting in faith? That's good. What? Having friends? When a sinner repents. Who said that? Oh, it's Rachel. She's my girl. Um, it is. Luke chapter 15 tells three stories. Do you know what's in Luke chapter 15? The lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost boy, right? What did they do after they were found in heaven? They had a party, didn't they? They had a party. It is people who are added to his kingdom that brings joy to Jesus' heart. When we all get to heaven, I can imagine that the Father is sitting at the gate and he's applauding you and jumping, out for, jumping up and down for joy as we enter. That's what brings joy to Jesus' heart is people like you and those around you adding to his. And it says, um, remember these three stories in the Bible. But what did they do when they were found? They, uh, they were rejoiced. Now the last servant only received one talent, didn't he? Did he take any risks? Right? No, he didn't. Why? Why didn't he take the risks that the other two didn't? That's the key. That's the key. This is what's exciting. Hold on. You've been here for for 30 minutes now. This is it. I'm going to come down to closing here, and I want you to listen to this because this is pretty exciting. Because in this story, I always thought it's just about money and how we spend our money and all that. No, it's much much more than that, okay? So he says, uh, this guy, his servant only received one talent. He didn't take any risk. He buried it, what was given to him, to keep it safe. And, the, and, and here's what he says. <clears throat> Listen to this. this. This is the key to the story. You got your Bibles open? It's Matthew 25, okay? Master, I knew you to be a hard man. Reaping where you do not sow. Can you get anything out of reaping without sowing? No. And gathering where you scatter not. When you scatter no seed. Can you, if you go out and plant a garden and don't put any seed in it, you might get lots of weeds, but you're not going to get 
what you want out of it, are you? So here he says, I knew you were a hard man expecting more than is possible. Isn't that right? Isn't that what he thinks, thinks about God, right? He thinks about God as this hard taskmaster. And he says, so I was what? Afraid. Was he living by faith? He was living by fear. I was afraid, he said. So what was the difference between he and the first two? Fear. And what caused the fear? The cause of the fear was I went and hid your towel in the ground, and here you have what is yours. Okay? I got it. Here, it's yours. So this servant thought he knew his master and was afraid of him. So no risk taking if you fear what the master might do to you if you fail. Right? If I don't risk anything, I won't fail, right? That's the attitude this servant had. It's much safer just to just hide it. Then that mean old taskmaster can't fault me, right? So what was the difference? It was their impression and knowledge of the master. Did you hear me? Because that's the key. The difference between those two was and living a life of faith or living a life of fear is what we know about God and our impression and what we think He is like. That will determine a lot of how we live. Does that make sense? Is there an amen or something out there? I don't know if you're here. You know what? It is a little late and you're falling asleep. But let me go. That's what I said. Um, so the servant said... What it was the difference in the first two servants? Because they had this impression and knowledge of the difference. The first two had an impression the master was, that was different. They believed that he was a gracious and loving master. And the last servant believed, because it caused him fear, that he was a hard taskmaster. And the master said to him, So you think I'm a hard taskmaster? Expecting to reap where I don't sow and gather where I've not planted? If that's what you think about me then you should have at least taken the talent and put it in the bank and let someone else take the risk. Right? Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. My friends, God is not pleased because we don't have faith because he doesn't want us to live in fear. Because the opposite of faith, either you're, you can't have one or the other. You're either living by faith or you're living by fear. You're making decisions out of fear or you're living, making decisions out of faith. There's no middle ground. It's either or. And God knows what it's like for people to live in fear. There are no guarantees in this life except one, and that's God's guarantee. There's no guarantees when you go out your front door that you will come back home. There's no guarantees. But I can tell you right now, if you don't come back home, Jesus has a place for you, and he will make all things right, and you will be home eventually. My friends, while we are waiting for Jesus to come, he doesn't want us to worry about the time of trouble and live our lives in fear. If the difference in the servant was their relationship with the master, master, which led them to either live by faith or live by fear, which one are you? Only you can choose that. Only you can choose to live by fear or by faith. And the only way that you can get rid of fear is to know the master. In the past, I felt guilty because I was worried if I was being faithful with God, uh, all that God had blessed me with in helping others and furthering his kingdom. I, I lived my life on guilt and fear. I felt that I was never going to make it in the judgment because I've always felt like I've disappointed God or I've not been faithful in all that I could do. And then I, then I read these texts. You want to hear them? By this, 1 John 4, 17 through 19, but this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. How many are looking forward to the day of judgment? 
some of you have a good concept of what the judgment is all about. But perfect, he says, so perfect love will give us confidence in the day of judgment because he is also, is so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love, why? Because he loved us first. My friends, if God is for us, who can be against us? And here's the, cl here's the clincher. How do you see God? Because how you see God will determine how you live your life. You know, you and I, people have enough stress in their lives. If we're going to go out and witness because we're afraid, right? I have to go out and witness because I'm afraid. We don't, it's not stemming from love for people, but we just go out and do it because we feel we're obligated to do that. I'm going to tell you something. People are going to look at you and say, i got enough stress in my life. I don't need any more fear. i got all kinds of things to fear, be afraid of. I don't know, need you. And that's why when, people, when a preacher gets up and begins to, to, to use fear as a motivation to get people to come to Jesus, it's all the wrong way. Because I want you to know that God is your biggest fan. He's your biggest fan. He is there just like a parent. How many of you have kids that are in sports? Okay. Are you there at most of the games? I remember my dad coming out, and he would see me play basketball at Columbia Academy. And, it, you know, I had some of my best games because I had my dad there watching me. My friends, God is watching your life. And he's your biggest fan. He's your biggest fan. He cheers you on. He's not in your life to see if you can get you to fail or stumble or fall. He's not trying to add to your load in your life. He's trying to help you carry the load. In fact, looks into these words. Write this down. This is good stuff. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. How many this week feel like you got so much on your plate you can't keep up with it? Right? I mean, we're here. That's, that's a part of the 21st century, to be overwhelmed. Come to me all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I remember going to a rugby game at University of Delaware, and I shared this earlier this week. Rugby game, <clears throat> and how many of you have seen rugby? Any of you seen rugby? It's pretty rough. You think American football's rough? Anyway, it was, I had a, a church member who was playing in this game, and I was watching there because he invited me to be there. And one of the players on his team came running off the field to his mom, who was there cheering. She had been cheering and yelling and screaming, you know. And, and he came off, and here he had two fingers that were just bent over like this. They were all out of place. The mother took those fingers, popped them back in the place, and shoot them back in there and says, Get back in the game! Go get him! And was cheering him on and saying, all right, win! And they won the game. And they celebrated. But I don't think, even if they lost the game, I think she'd still celebrate it because that's her son and she's proud of him. He's a tough one. My friend God is our heavenly parent who comes to all our games and cheers us on whether we win or lose. He's always there. God is for us. He's not against us. So each day before you go out your front door, because it is a risky business, that he goes with you to cheer you on and to help you succeed. That's why Jesus said, in waiting for his coming, we are to live by faith, not by fear, because we know the truth about who God is. That he is a kind, heavenly master. And his message to you today is, don't be afraid. I've got your back. Don't worry. I got this. My friends, today, I want you, from before you leave this place, is to make a choice. 
to live your life by faith, not by fear. And don't let anybody put you in that place of fear because you have a big fan who's cheering you on in life. And he doesn't want to add to your burdens. He wants to take those burdens away from you. Is that good news or what? Amen. Really? Amen. Well, then let's say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the message that you gave to us that you are our biggest fan and that we can live a life of faith and trust in you and not have to go around being fearful because you already have accepted us as your children. So Lord, I pray that everyone who today as they leave this place will make that decision to live by faith and not by fear. And we pray it all in Jesus' name.